I love India. India is just a place that is uh, unique from most parts of the world. Interesting sights and sounds and sensations. Uh, there's 1.3 billion people in India and they're all packed into this, this very small space. So it, it's a very dense population. So it, it's unique from any other place in the world in that matter as well. They're big into curry. I mean, I know that they play cricket and that was about the extent of what I knew about India. And call me uncultured if you will, but that, that's where it was. So yeah, expectations going into it, I don't think we really felt like we had a ton, um, but just overall was just yeah, baffling at what we saw. I, I visited India 10 times now. The last time was just a few months ago. I always love going to India. It always impacts me, but there was something about this particular trip and it, it's hard for me to, uh, to put a finger on. We visited the Kali Temple. It's a very popular temple in, in uh, Kolkata, India, up in the Bengali area. And I've been there before, but again, this time was different. And when we went in and the first thing is we kind of make your way through this maze, this complex, if you will, uh, through this temple. And it's very dirty, there's a lot of people. Again, just like the country of India, just this dense population. The uh, worship is also very dense and everybody's you know rubbing up against each other and it's very loud and, and chaotic. We came to this, this, this room where it's very dark and uh, people are getting crowded into that and I looked down and I noticed there's this little goat, just this little kid goat, jet black, but it had uh, tikka on its little horns and I knew what that meant. It means this, this goat is about to be sacrificed to the goddess Kali. Kali is a, again a, a female goddess and she's just about uh, blood and death and darkness. And one of the darker, I believe, of, of all the goddesses of India. Like we saw a little baby goat there and I'm like, well, it's about to happen. And within 15 seconds, the legs are spread, samurai sword raised up and head cut off, draining blood into cups and splash on the wall. It was just like, that just happened? Like, what the heck? Like. And when we exited, I'll never forget what Garrett said when, when we left. Um, and he looks at me and he goes, what am I supposed to do with that? What, what did we just see back there? That's just, that's just crazy. I don't even have a place to put that. And then my mind reflected to Southern India where we had just come from. And there was another temple there that we visited down in a place called Belgum. Um, one of the criteria we knew for the Belgium Temple was that there were Devadasis, which Devadasi is a temple prostitute. Um, and that was one thing that like you hear about and you're like, that can't be real. That's surely not a real thing. But sure enough, we went to a place and actually saw the Devadasis there. So yeah, everything about it was just overwhelming. Um, that these people had to come bathe in the stagnant water that's been sitting there from the Ganges River. And then that's how they wash themselves and then they move on over to the temple where they throw tikka, tikka on each other um, and worship and give money to and bow down to these idols. That's it's Idol worship is the exact definition of what we saw all across the country. So that was something that was just unlike anything I've ever seen. We met one specific Devadasi that had just committed mm -hmm. to becoming a Devadasi and she was coming around um, so I understood like asking for an offering to like congratulate her on taking this step in her life. Upon exiting the, the temple area, I noticed these two older ladies. I don't know how old they were, but I'm sure they were much younger than they looked. They looked quite old. And of the two, one of them just really stood out to me as she, she held her different type of bowl and she's begging for alms from all of us that are exiting the temple. This ex Devadasi had no light in her eyes. And she really, and I don't want to over dramatize here, over sensationalize this, but she kind of looked like the living dead. It was crazy to see the excitement that some of these younger girls yet walking around with an offering plate of like, hey, I just committed my life to sex as a sexual temple prostitute. And it's like, no, like that's like the saddest thing I've ever seen before. And, and then seeing the people that have literally spent their entire life serving this God, being screwed by the system, and then forever being screwed by the system as untouchables on the temple steps. I don't know, you, you think about, like that's in India though. That's in India, we don't know those people. We don't, that's, 
But it's like, what if that's your kid? Like, what if that's a girl you go to school with? What if that's a cousin, a niece, or whatever? And it's like, man, like, it starts hitting a little closer to home. Um, starts messing with you. Starts to think like, man, how this is? How is that right? How does that make sense? But then, here's the cool part. For me, part of the highlight was going, and on the very first day of a girl empowerment program, we go just a few kilometers down the street, and we're starting this girl empowerment program where we meet 32 girls whose, whose life would have been to be a Devadasi. And I realized that Forgotten Children is breaking up that cycle. And people like you get to help us do that. We're breaking the cycle of little girls who have to become temple prostitutes. And these 32 girls are a part of a, of a program where they're gonna learn that, hey, I'm an empowered girl. And they're sharp, you can see them. And they were just sitting a little taller, a little brighter, and they, they did have light in their eyes. Uh, unlike their, their mothers who had been temple prostitutes and their grandmothers who had been temple prostitutes, and they were learning that you do have rights. You, you can be an empowered woman, an empowered girl. And uh, I, I listened to them through translators and I think they believed it. As I'm watching them learn that they don't have to have an early marriage, that they don't have to be abused in this patriarchal society, they get to stand up for themselves. What you see behind us is gonna be the graduating class of the very first uh, girl empowerment program. And they're gonna go back to their villages and they will start groups along with uh, instructors that will meet with them. And they're gonna start another 20 groups. So literally the first time around about 100 to 150 girls we believe will be impacted. Then every six months that will continue and these groups will just continue to, to grow and grow and there's this ripple effect. It's not about girls are all weak and they can't do it. No, girl empowerment is coming along young ladies and young women who actually are very strong, but it's about giving them a voice. They do not have a voice. And they're never going to have a voice until men stand up. Until men stand up on behalf of women and say, we're not gonna to tolerate this anymore that's when you're gonna to start to see a change, is when guys get in the game. Like I know the Forgotten Children does closed packaging, because that's what we do, that's what you see in the community, that's what you can volunteer for. Actually, I town on Saturdays going to pack clothes, and it's like, hey, that's, that's great, it's, it's needed, it's a real thing. But yeah, the Girl Empowerment pro Program, I would have, I don't think I would have had any idea what they actually do and what they're actually like, who they're actually affecting and the good that it's actually doing over there had I not seen it firsthand. This is their only, shot at life, this is their only shot at doing anything other than what they've known, other than what they've been committed to for the rest of their lives. I mean, this affects not only them, but it affects their children and their grandchildren, and it's just this line that it can turn with one single person helping one single girl. And so if we're gonna to continue to change lives, it's gonna take uh, people like you to link arms with others, and uh, we, we can make a difference together. Uh, but nobody can do this alone. You can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. It's gonna take, uh, it's gonna take an army. But this, this can't be done and we can make a difference.